Welcome, everybody. It's so nice of you to come out tonight. Thank you so much for being here. What a, what a great group. A lot of photography friends in the audience here tonight. So nice to see all of you. I'm Danny Lichtenfeld, the director of the Brattleboro Museum. Happy New Year. Hope you had nice holidays. Um, very excited about this in-person event uh, here tonight. Um, and I'm just going to tell you a little bit about our uh, guests, and then I'm going to turn it over to them. And then I think there will be time that um, Makita and Renata are going to chat for a while, and we'll listen in. And then I'm sure there will be time for questions afterwards. Great. Um, so Makita Best is the Richard L. Menschel Curator of Photography and the interim head of the Division of Modern and Contemporary Art at the Harvard Art Museums. Her scholarly interests focus on 19th and 20th century American photography with a special interest in photojournalism, documentary, war photography, and text and image works. Before taking her current role at Harvard Art Museums, Makita was an assistant professor of visual studies at the California College of Arts, an assistant curator and graduate fellow at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, and she taught at the University of Vermont for two years where she developed museum-based learning courses related to the history of photography and American art. Makita wrote an essay in Renata's book uh, of the, the same name as the exhibition, The Space Between Memory and Expectation, and very kindly allowed us to reproduce that in the catalog for, for the exhibition. Um, so we're so happy that Makita's here. Thank you. Thank you for doing this. Uh, Renata Aller is the artist responsible for this extraordinary work you see around you. So I probably don't really need to say more than that. Um, but I will also tell you that Renata was born in Germany and is based in New York. Several beautiful books of her work have been published by Kira Verlag and Radius Books of Santa Fe. Renata's works are in the collections of corporate institutions, private collectors, and museums, including the Lannan Foundation, the National Gallery of Art, Yale University Art Gallery, George Eastman House, New Britain Museum of American Art, the Parish Art Museum, and many others. Uh, it's been a really special joy to work on this project with Renata. I um, saw one of her pictures in a gallery in Santa Fe, and um, it wasn't quite as large as the ones that we have here, but it was pretty big. And um, one of the things that's, I think it was an oceanscape. And one of the things that um, really struck me about it was how I was like feeling this image in my whole body, not just in my eye, not just through my eyes and, and my brain. And um, the director of the gallery, uh, you know, studiously took note of, <laughs> my interest and came and, and talked with me and began telling me a bit about Renata and then pointed me towards several of her books that he had and at that point I was just totally smitten and he subsequently put us in touch and here we are about not even two years later um, with this beautiful project that uh, Renata has put together specifically for our museum uh, for which I'm so grateful and um, it's been such a special experience so thank you Renata. And thank you all of you for being here and really looking forward to tonight's conversation. Thank you, Danny. Um, I first want to thank you for inviting my work into this space. Um, uh, as you know, I went right away and looked at the room and tried to kind of react also to the architecture rather than fighting the architecture. You know, there's a very dominant features here. And because the, you know, the previous exhibition was at the Parish Museum, where it was kind of just basically wrapping around the room, and it was a totally different experience, um, I think that this one is more successful because it's not just a space that facilitates the work on the wall. I've actually tried to um, react to the space and incorporate it. So you can see it sometimes, I probably did it subconsciously, not always sort of, you know, really thinking about it. But when I look now, um, some of the textures 
from the marble. They kind of relate to the images and so the scale kind of works. And I think because I only had a few days to before presenting it to you, because uh, we were here on a Sunday and you said that you had the next meeting on a Friday about the shows for the next year. Um, I think I had about two days in putting this together, which means like I found photos of the space, erased the current amazing show that was hanging here and kind of just put these on. And I'm not a really graphic artist, so it wasn't a great job, but you got the idea. Um, and sort of the scale was pretty much uh, right. And uh, maybe thinking back, it was a good thing that I didn't have more time because when I worked on putting this together, I still was in the space and I could still feel the space. If I had three months, it probably wouldn't have been so good. Just a little thought <laughs> on how sometimes um, it, the amount of time you have to work on something has not necessarily to do with the quality of it. So. But it's interesting, you're an artist, Renata, who, who thinks a lot about translating your work into different spaces and different formats. I mean, you, you do books, you do exhibitions like this. And so maybe you could talk a little bit about that, what, that, what that's like, um, thinking in different, different ways and different experiences that you're trying to create in a book versus in this type of space. Yeah, I mean, that kind of comes to kind of roll back to the time when we met, which was the first, you would, Makita was the last person in my studio. We were having lunch and you looked at work up on the wall and on little portfolio prints to yeah. write the essay. Yeah. And so and that- And the only way I've known your work since is through books. So I had to like translate <laughs> <laughs> right, and it, but also for me, you're part of my permanent memory because you all, everybody remembers the last person mm -hmm. they actually um, saw. We didn't touch because we were already aware of the yes. fact that yes. we should keep a little distance. And um, I have to quickly say though that I want to congratulate you before we go into more depth oh, on this this book, Devara Lanand, is. Um, that's your book. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I have to congratulate you because not just I think it's amazing. She's actually won the Aperture Prize and Perry Photo for this. <laughs> and um, not just because it's beautiful, it's actually the content is really fantastic. I love it. Oh, I just bent something. I love this book. So I could talk about this on and on, but you started writing this book um, when the same time you wrote from Essen when we met. So yes. there's this connection. And so you were also translating thoughts into um, into a book, you yes. know? Yeah, um, well, trying to imagine, also trying to imagine what it's gonna look like on the wall and the exhibition as well. Yes, so because similar, you created a show at the yes. same time. So when I visited you in 2020, you were, you were talking about the works, it was going to be a book, and I had no idea it was gonna be an exhibition as well. Oh, you didn't? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I see, yeah. yeah. No, you're right, yeah, yes. yeah. But you knew that your work was yes. gonna be an yes. exhibition. Yes, that That's right. An exhibition. Um, yeah, no, I'm very lucky that this, um, this is an exhibition because, again, it's a, I, yeah, I, I think, um, yes, okay, to, to roll back to the translation, mm -hmm. um, I, I, I said to you the other day that, um, some people think I travel around, I take all pretty pictures, and then I sort of look at them, and then I make an exhibition or a book. And that's not how it happens, actually, because um, I have a sort of condition where I translate sounds into shapes and colors. It's got a name, and, but uh, it doesn't really matter whether it's what it is, but. What happens is that um, my, when I read, I actually 
translate the word into a sound. We all do that, I guess. And then the sound into the image. So if I read a book, sometimes I would, I'm convinced I've seen the movie because mm -hmm. I'm creating it in my head and maybe I haven't seen it, you mm -hmm. know. A um, friend of mine who works has a film production company. She reads scripts and creates movies. And her and I were talking about this the other day and she understood what I was talking about. Mm -hmm. So that is sort of one starting point of how you can translate. So my idea is I first create a concept of thought, um, an intention of what interests me. And then I collect the visuals, meaning I go to somewhere and photograph something. I might collect, take an image that I've already taken, but um, that really happens afterwards. So that... Um, yeah, it's so, it's so interesting because of reading your, well, seeing the work in person and then thinking about writing about it, that was one of my first impressions was that they were things that you thought you had seen before. And then, of course, the, work, the, the, the title of the, the project has the word memory in it. Um, you know, you feel the sense of, wait, is this a space I've been to before? Um, in some ways, they, they, there are aspects of them, the details, the things that you think that you've seen but you're not, you're not quite sure, you probably haven't, but there's this quality in them of, of, a, of, a, of a memory of something. Yeah, thank you. That's, uh, I'm trying to create a familiarity. And uh, for example, um, people who have been to the desert necessarily have never been to an ocean but they will have a memory of it. They recognize immediately, it. they feel akin with an ocean, you know? Well, and that's, a, that's, a, that's, the, that's for me, that's it, that it is, you recognize the feeling of the space. Like you might not see it, you might not recognize mm -hmm. the details, but, you, but, but the feeling is so familiar of, of being on the edge of something or being, you know, in awe of, so like you're, you're, you're conjuring up these feelings that the places feel like you, you know them, but then you don't. So there's this interesting gap that you engage in as, as a viewer. Yes, and the word gap, of course, brings us to the point that, and that's what, what we talked about, where, because you wrote an essay for the book, not for this exhibition, even though the, there's a part in the book that I can't paraphrase, but you were talking about the experience of um, the, the two pages that you're looking at and, and also the, the act of turning a page. Yeah. Because I thought, uh, for me, it's kind of easy, I, th I think it's easy, to create a room experience. Mm -hmm. I find, I mean, I, find, I love that. If anybody ever gives me a big room, I'll, I'll do that. Mm -hmm. I'm in any museum, any, any awkward space. I love to create a room experience. Um, but to translate that into a book is very difficult, I think. I mean, some people make books and then they think about an exhibition afterwards. And for me, it was difficult to translate that into a book mm -hmm. because I had to... Um, find that rhythm. It's a bit like when you're writing music, mm -hmm. You've, I ha you know, you find the rhythm because people stay with a page longer than they do apparently in front of a picture in a museum or gallery. And I can't predict really how somebody um, looks at my book. I, I can control you a little bit more how you experience this. Mm -hmm. But you know how we look at books, we sort of go backwards, which we shouldn't do, but everybody does, I do, you know, and you, um, so you, you can't really predict that, but you still want to make sure that somebody doesn't take the book and says, oh, Renate takes such beautiful various landscape photos and they're all in one book, aren't we lucky? Yes, that, yes. that sort of, you know, that's not the intention, even though they might end up being beautiful and look great over your sofa too. But um, my intention is to really 
create an experience where you understand the interconnectedness of, um, of nature mm -hmm. and maybe even see yourself in it because we are such an integral part of nature. And that's, I think, where the intimacy in the images comes. That even though these are places where many of us have probably never been, the, the feelings that you create are, are where you create this connection with the viewer. And so it's a very intimate experience at the same time as it's so far out there. It's, it's so far from us, but yet it's, it's, it's very intimate and tangible. Yeah, for example, mountains. Some, some of these mountains are very, very high, like the Himalayas there. And uh, even Torres del Paine and the German Alps, usually when you're in the valley and you're looking at mountains, that's why I wouldn't live in a valley, because they tower over you. Mm -hmm. And they're kind of a bit threatening. You're sort of fascinated. And somebody once said to me that my mountains uh, are not threatening, right. they actually do the opposite, they're reassuring. And in yeah. these insecure times that we're living in, yeah. um, it's very important to surround yourself with nature that is not threatening, but that's reassuring. And it's odd that they're reassuring even though, other than this, maybe this one and maybe this tree, there is no real sense of ground. I was about that my essay. Like you feel like you're just stepping right into something, but yet it's it, there's not a sense of fear of that. Maybe also because if um, I mean we are constructed as human beings to always um, sort of we sort of send out senses to understand where we are in our surroundings. And uh, we have to understand what distance something is and how high is it. And we keep doing that in the city too. I always say that the water towers mess with us because they're different sizes. Yeah. So you don't understand really the distance because you can't judge it, mm -hmm. you know. But we do that all the time. That's sort of built into our nature. And when you look at some of these images, let's say that from there, the glacier mm -hmm. behind you, it's, um, it's, you don't understand the scale. Right, right, I mean, it could right. be this size or whatever. You don't know right. where are you in relationship to this, which makes you actually stop and look at the picture longer because yeah. you, like you do in nature, you try and figure out where am I in relationship to this space. Mm -hmm. And so if you lose the scale, um, which a lot of them have, you also create an abstraction. So that's basically a situation where um, you have to actually now invent for yourself where you are what is your reality in relationship to what you're looking at? Yeah. And that way, you're already at the point where you're having a relationship with mm -hmm. what you're looking at. And I always believe that an abstract image, which doesn't, it can be very literal, like that's a mountain, but you don't know the scale. And that way, I call it abstract, because once you lose the scale, that's an abstraction, I think, in my books. Then. Um, you create a sort of intimacy in a way, because uh, you, you, you listen to the image. And, and that's so interesting that, the, well, it's a relationship with the image and with you right, as, as the maker in a very interesting way. Like you wouldn't look at these and think, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to you know, relate to the artist here, but in, in encountering and in, in engaging viewers in that kind of work, it's a relationship with you as a maker as well. Yeah, because I allow you to look with my eyes. Yeah. You know, yes. I'm, I'm not tricking you. <laughs> Can we go back to something you mentioned? You said you were talking about music, and, and we talked uh, recently, and, and you told me something surprising, well, actually something I can relate to, and that you said that you didn't come to photography as a photographer, and you were studying all these other things, and, mm -hmm. and we had this really interesting discussion about 
um, being exposed to photography early on, and I think you yeah. were interested in music. Yeah, I mean, actually, I, um, I, I grew up in Germany, and, and my, my parents, uh, actually, they didn't believe in television, and magazines were trashy. Um, so the only photos that I was exposed to were my father's slides from vacations. And uh, well, what kind of where, like around oh, Germany endless, or other mountains? Uh, well, we mountains. only went to mountains. <laughs> okay, okay. I come from <laughs> Flatland, Hamburg, but every vacation we were driving to the mountains and we didn't stay in fancy hotels, we stayed in little huts and we were hiking all day. And I, I think at that time, I probably wish I'd be somebody else's daughter. You know, I had a similar upbringing, yes, hiking to the campground, yeah. standing in streams and getting buckets of water. It's like they have running water somewhere. Yeah, <laughs> and you're hungry, then get some blueberries yes. on the way, you know. Put and your food in the tree. And it's like, come on. like Right. Wow. And there's, you know, so I was, uh, that's how I grew up. And my father used to then do what they make funny films about that. He used to do these slideshows for our best friends and us. And uh -huh. we would sit there. <laughs> and he would make us wait until he remembers every name of every peak. And sometimes we say, oh, it doesn't matter. And he, he would not go to the next slide. <laughs> to... Now, I don't always remember the name of peaks, probably because of that. Yeah. And I sometimes have to look it up. <laughs> and people go, what's that peak? Is that? And I'm like, I think so. But <laughs> and uh, usually you, you, I think, I saw that picture, Danny, and you, I think you remembered where it was and you were, have been there, but um, that's, that's not that's really so relevant for me what the name of the peak was, but I wish I would remember better. But so what happened was that I grew up, my parents took me to a museum, but then I would see Caspar David Friedrich paintings mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. my godmother had some Hundertwasser and Noldis and, mm -hmm. you know, I was, I never really saw photography. I mean, yes, on the advertisement, those round things, you know, cigarette mm -hmm. advertisement or something like that, mm -hmm. but uh, washing powder. But I never really was exposed. But um, from very early, I think I was 14 or 15, I started reading uh, because of friends who I was with. I, started reading um, Walter Benjamin and, and Theodor Adorno and, um, you know, Roland Barthes, I mean, in German, obviously. Also. So I read about photography and words before I was introduced to the actual images. And I told you that the other day yeah. because I wasn't yeah. aware of that, but yeah. when I was thinking of our talk, I thought, well, you write about photography, even though I know you used to do photography, but you write about photography. I can only write about two pages or something, and then I'm done, and then I maybe write another two, but they're not connected, so I'm not very good in writing long books, you know? Um, so I thought, um, what connects us, really, you know, apart from the fact that, you know, you did this landscape book while I was doing mine. And, and we were a lot tortured of... on our vacations as young people. Right, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, you know, we have um, a friend who connected us, you know, but uh, I was thinking, actually, yeah, it's the word. Um, I actually learned um, about photography through words. Okay. And then when I realized that, I translate words into images, you know, but I've seen the movie. I've yeah. seen them. Yeah. Um, but it's interesting that also you were reading authors who were very interested in memory and loss yeah. and, um, you know, transientness of images. And, and, and so it's, and also what's interesting to me is the story of your father and these, um, watching these slides is there's a real luminescence to your, your photographs that very much recalls looking at a slide and the kind of glowing light that comes um, from that kind of film. Um, well, they were stages also because my mom, because she's married, she was married to him. She's still alive. He hasn't. She would 
know how to pose. She had this sort of gaze into the distance <laughs> thing She was going. like Friedrich. She was like in a beyond. Oh, yeah, Friedrich. no, she knew. And <laughs> we always thought she might die on one of these photo shoots because he kept saying, go a bit further, Hannah, a bit further. <laughs> and poor Hannah kept stepping back until she was basically nearly, you know, in the abyss or so. My sister, who's much older than I am, and you know, she has like, like long, dark, shiny hair, and she insisted on wearing mini skirts in the mountains, and she looked like a sort of Italian film star, and she looks like that in the pictures. And then there's me in all these slides, and I always use that slide when I give a slide talk as a first slide. Mm -hmm. I'm standing with the back to my father, who's forever trying to arrange this image so that he doesn't waste photos. And I'm standing there sort of with the back to him and my face, you know, my head down. And, you know, psychiatrists would say, you know, I have a terrible problem with my family. And, you know, it's a very clear case there of a teenage situation. I was 12 years old, I think. But I was actually standing with the back to him because I was composing with my Akfa mm -hmm. click, my mm -hmm. brownie, mm -hmm. my own picture. Mm -hmm. And I had to look down. I had only eight photos per vacation, mm -hmm. which Germans have long vacations, like three weeks. So, so I had, had to really photos. think about what picture to take. Oh. And yeah, that's... Um, I love that. I mean, because each of these <laughs> images is so, you know, it's... It, it, they're so contained. Well, I still actually, that's the train coming yeah. <laughs> <laughs> from Boston, I think, right? Um, so I, um, I still, every time, even though this is um, digital capture, all of this, I treat the train, <laughs> I treat them as if. This is a train station, an old train station. That still is a train station. Um, so I treat each image as if it's the first and last one I ever take. I never think about the series. Well, I haven't necessarily developed this here. I don't think about why I take the picture or, you know, I literally look through and I very often, I understand also why people used to have like class mm -hmm. because I sometimes, you know, Hugh has photos of me doing that, my husband. I, I go like this sometimes. I only want to see, I could use my laptop to look, but I don't want to only see what I'm seeing because you only see this and mm -hmm. afterwards. You don't, I mean, that carries on like that about <laughs> the ocean just carries on. But these landscapes, you don't see what's there. Yeah. You, you see that. Yeah. And that's what I should be producing because, yeah. you know, I have to forget about the rest of the landscape yeah. and isolate the image. It's, it's a, I, when you were talking about your father as well, I have to keep going back to that, but there's a there's a kind of conventionality to landscape images and and you know many ways these photographs remind you sort of of like the 19th century and people have talked about that in your work before and and but those landscapes are very much about possession right and, and your works are you're not about offering us these spaces to own and to to have and to fantasize it really is this kind of interior project and in that way there was a there was an author that I read who said that your work was about the idea of landscape, and mm -hmm. I wondered what you, what you thought about that. Well, I have to say to that that my parents um, kind of escaped, um, well, they, they, they were alive after the war, luckily, but at 45, my mom left a camp. She was told that the war's over, she didn't know, um, a labor camp, and they were freed and she made her way by herself with what, just what she was wearing on her body to northern Germany. And um, so my parents always wanted to make sure, I think they spent their entire life, and they sort of in a way still do, which is sometimes annoying, um, that my sister and I should never get lost in the political landscape, which, you know, they lived through really tough times and 
and the emotional landscape and the actual landscape. Mm. So we were taught to learn where it's south and north, when you look at the tree with the mosses and, you know, look at the sun and all that. And still get lost, but I was mm -hmm. taught not to get lost. <coughs> but it was also important for them that um, I would always find my bearings. Mm -hmm. And come to that, um, I used to, I had a project of, called Heimat, and that kind of is, was based on the fact that Heimat is a word that doesn't really exist anymore because it describes a space, and to me, landscape means space. Mm -hmm. And spaces um, are very deeply connected to identity. You know, people come from spaces, and if, if they get dislocated or the immigrants, or whatever, the connection to space, to land, is a very deep one. You know, I mean, your mother works also, loves working with the land, right? And mm -hmm. so you know that the connection to the land is a very important one. But of course, the ownership is like an additional right. thing. And um, I've done a lot of work about um, one project you can see on my website. It's called um, um, Whose Place Is It Anyway? Mm -hmm. um, which really means, do, w when, when do you belong somewhere? when you just in, you know, you're born there or you invade it or because you love the place mm -hmm. or because, you know, you got a passport. Why, what gives you the right to be in a place and have the ownership? And so, like you said, the, the spaces that I usually photograph uh, what you call in German, there was an article the other day, but just um, Sehnsuchtsorte, which is places of longing, if you translate mm -hmm. it. But it's sort of, I don't really know how to translate it but well, because it's not as deep. Those are places that you, like you said, you, you can't own them. You can visit them. We can, this, these are a Wanderdune. These are um, moving dunes. Mm -hmm. So you can't really build a house there. You can't build a house on the ocean. You can't live on top of a glacier. Uh, you, you, you can visit those places, but you can't own them. And of course, there's a political aspect to it because mm -hmm. governments own them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, I have to refer, you all have to get this book. I have to refer to your writing there again, where you, in, in, in interesting from different angles refer you can talk about this better but refer to the military or well governments and then the military how they own and use and misuse the land mm -hmm. and of course with that also create situations of the ownership maybe you can talk about that oh well, but I wonder I want to ask <laughs> you, you want to though. ask me I want to ask you though because I I, I, I mean it, you were talking that you know, we can't build a house here, we can't own this, but, but implicitly you're also talking about the loss, like the threat of the loss of these spaces as well. Yes. At the same time as we can't have them, there, there, there's, a, there's a loss that is occurring that you're also engaging in. And when we were talking before, you told me that you're, you were also involved in Project Pressure before, so there is mm -hmm. a, you are thinking about um, climate change and, and what it means to not have a future without these spaces. Yes, um, I, I've done that for many years, and it's always been one of the underlying um, subjects, mm -hmm. of course, mm -hmm. about the, when I started doing The Oceans, there's a book which the museum owns, but you can't buy it anymore, I think. It's, um, I, I photographed the ocean from the same spot for over 20 years. Um, and uh, yes, it had a lot to do with the, uh, pollution of the ocean, because the ocean has self-healing minerals, but obviously there's a limit to that. And um, when the ocean warms, for example, through climate change, it affects the glaciers. Um, in exhibitions, sometimes we show it because scientists like to make it easier for people to understand that, you know, that it kind of 
know, trickles down from the glacier and the mountain down and it ends up in the ocean and in one of my projects in New York Harbor, this eight images that I created for another space with project pressure. Um, because the effect really, I believe though that it starts with the ocean because the ocean warms and that has more impact on the rest of the um, environment mm -hmm. than just the glaciers, which are far away. And you could say, well, I don't care if the glacier melts. But actually, the glacier in Chile, that one, is our future too. It's not just their own future and a beautiful place for people to travel to in Patagonia. It's actually our own water resources too. And that one of the noticeable things about the the work here and other work, other of your work is, you know, you don't necessarily know where each place is. Like you're not saying, hey, this is this place and this is this exotic space. Can you talk a little bit about that kind of disorienting that you're you're kind of engaging in? That, that it's not you don't want people to, you know, be focusing on this is this is the place. Um, and we were talking earlier about. Uh, a different kind of photography, a kind of National Geographic type mm -hmm. of that, or, that was an art. Is that is that kind of sense of and you, you use the term disembodiment? Is that mm -hmm. part of that? How you're creating that in these kinds of spaces? Yeah, I mean, talking about the locations, I when I go to a museum, I've, I I don't know if you do that. I first look at right. the label, exactly. then I step back and, you go, oh. and look at the image. <laughs> yeah, and you would totally lose that experience that you would have between, let's say, these spaces where like the cloud kind of continues in here and you kind of feel that it's a connection between the two of them and you don't question it. And you think, well, this could be maybe one landscape, you know, and that ocean sort of carries on into that thing. And I like you to enjoy that. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I would put the label right next to it, it would become just a collection of nature images. And the first thing you think about, I would think about, is, oh, have I been there? Right. Does it look like the place that yeah. I know? Yeah. And there are curators who've been telling me that I have to put it right next to it, because mm -hmm. that's what you do. And I say, well, it's available. I'm not hiding it, because up there around the corner on the platform, right. You, there's a map and you can look it up or in the book where these places are, which is interesting afterwards because then you go, wow, I can't believe that's Patagonia that's, yeah, and right yeah. next to it, it goes into yeah. the Alps, yeah. which of course are a different scale and different materials also. And it's so interesting because you start to think about color and similarity and shape and, and, and you know, you're, you're at one time thinking about these broader aspects of the images but you're also thinking about the details that differentiate the, each of the each of the spaces. Maybe um, people, people like to hear about this image, which is very unusual and different from you know from especially in relation to the rest of them. Maybe you could share a little bit about why yeah, I mean, this one is. Unique. This one wasn't really part of the show. I was going to put another picture there. And um, in May, I was invited. Um, I actually went with you to the desert in uh, Nevada, it was an hour away drive, really in the middle of nowhere, an hour away from the next r ranch, and it wasn't always possible, the road. So basically, no, no internet, no connection, nothing. And I thought, you know, I'm going to take landscape photos. Um, we did some hiking also, but you know, my, my equipment's very heavy, but I was going, wow, I can take from this house, little house, you know, which um, rain water, that's how you had a shower and very simple. Um, no electricity apart from solar. And I thought I'd just take photos from that location of the landscape because it's the intermittent desert. I think that's what it's called. Um, between mountains, basically desert between mountains, that's the word for that. Um, and I thought it was very fascinating because it creates a certain climate, very unpredictable, and it's a specific situation. Um, and I was also interested because they've done a lot of um, atomic tests in Nevada, which you point out in your book as well. And uh, because 
it's this nature that nobody needs. I think you said that's that. That's I think I'm just... They said you could bomb it into oblivion because there's nothing there. Yeah, so, <laughs> hey, we could just use that, you know? Never mind, there's a lot of wildlife and amazing things, but um, I think I was kind of paraphrasing from your book there, the sentence, and I... Um, I all of a sudden I felt invited by these jun juniper groves. I didn't expect that. I didn't even know there were junipers um, in that area. I've done all the research apart from the junipers. I didn't know about them. And so I started reading this little library because, you know, there was no internet anyway. And um, reading about junipers more and more in the groves. And But the key was that um, I started writing down in my diary. Um, you, you, actually, it's in the catalogue. If you get the catalogue, you can see part of my, my diary in there. How I was sort of... I, I took in the scent of those junipers and the sage and was mesmerised. And I thought they were a community, and I felt like I was welcomed into their community. Mm -hmm and they're these old, very wise trees. And, you know, they, they are, um, their sap is antibacterial, and, you know, if you just Google juniper trees, it's their healing, you know, it's a symbol of wisdom and health. And so that's why I started photographing them, but then I was invited to, to um, produce some tree images, and I thought, oh, I'll make one for here too. And uh, I, the photo actually looks quite different. It's just a very straight photo of uh, trees. You know, it's kind of nice, but maybe not that exciting with a very pale sky, because I like photographing when the sky is pale, usually, because blue skies are, are a distraction. And uh, so I started printing it on with UV print on 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 um, veneer and this is ash veneer and it sort of became important to me as in the sort of spirit of reciprocity I always have pronounced vision problems that's how it is not reciprocity um, because the ash trees are all dying and they're very important trees not just for Native Americans also I, th I think baseball bats are made of ash tree. I mean, ash, ash wood is used more than I realized and has a flexibility I think that other trees don't have and uh, they kind of grow faster and they're... they're and so it's printed on an ash. It's veneer. printed on ash. Yeah. And I wanted the junipers to kind of hug the ash in the spirit of protection. They're not going to protect them, and junipers don't like other trees. But you know, it's just, <laughs> it's just they just take care of themselves. Actually, their own community. Mm -hmm. But I like the idea of these very resilient trees to be printed on, on the veneer. And somebody said, "Oh, how can you use the ash veneer if the ashes are dying?" Oh, well, there is plenty of dead ash now, and so there is plenty of ash veneer. So I'm not really robbing. A, a, a live tree <laughs> off um, of it. So that, that's why this picture is hanging here. Is resilience an important idea for you? I'm just hearing yes. you say that. It's, I mean, in these photographs, I mean, there's, there's a sense of loss and potential ur urgency about that, mm. but there's also a sense of resilience and... Maybe hope also. Hope. Mm -hmm. I think hope is, is connected to resilience. If you hope, when we all need to hope, of course, without hope, there wouldn't be a future. But I learned the other day that hope just as a sort of wish doesn't work. It's like wishing for miracles. You have to get your butt off the sofa and do something with that hope in mind. Mm -hmm. um, so hope plus our actions is going to get us somewhere, not just the hope. You know? And it reminds me of the um, Ocean Desert Project um, when I took many years ago, I 
think 2012, I went over a few years to the White Sands. And that fascinated me because it's this absolutely pristine, because it's covered in gypsum, white desert. It's so beautiful and you think it's all the goodness because it's the sort of the paradise on earth because it's pristine and white and clean and beautiful. Um, of course, the, we know that that's where the Manhattan Project happened, 1945, which is the same year my mum survived and went up north, but that's a different story. But um, you also wrote about the, the um, White Sands, White Sands yeah. Project. Yeah. And the nuclear um, tests that were done, and at the time, maybe they thought it was okay, but because it was far away from anywhere. But I think, you know, the land is still contaminated. Of course, yeah. Of course. And yeah. yeah. The people who live nearby, of course, were usually poor people and disadvantaged people um, who had, and this is where both of us, I think, are interested also in the subject of the, um, the long-term toxicity effects that these things create or the damage to environments. I don't know, I think that looking at your work, I. I I think that there's a nice counterpoint that your your work reminds me of the long-term effects of what's happened when we're disconnected from these places. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that I'm thinking about literal kind of damage, and you're thinking about a kind of psychic toll of what happens when we are we're not connected, and what does yeah. it, what does the loss of that connection mean potentially, and what does it do for us? So I think that there's a nice kind of counterpoint to our interests there. Mm. Yes, coming from the same kind of route, which comes back to how do you translate mm -hmm. um, a concept, a thought, into images. And you use something which I thought was beautiful, um, correct me because I'm just remembering these words, the unseen. Um, to make the unseen visible. You didn't write it like that, but... Yeah, no, making, yeah. <laughs> but yeah which I, I don't know. I, I think that there are so many ways in which... It's funny that, as you said mm -hmm. from the beginning, that you were working on this and I was working on that. And, and, and for yours, it, I think... I think in my work, I was thinking about the unseen toxicity and, mm -hmm. and you're thinking about making connections, like unseen connections. Like, mm -hmm. how, do we, how, do we, how do we feel that? Right. How do we mm. how do we create a connection um, through artwork, and how do we connect with strangers, and how do we create connections in spaces? Um, another thing that's difficult to to see and quantify. Right? Yeah, that's um, well. I'm also grateful that we started the connection because we started it during the pandemic, and I remember after we met the first time, we were only talking on Zoom, and we were yeah. trying to. I was trying to not bother you too often because I remember saying to you, can you still write this essay because yeah, you have, <laughs> yeah, I meant yeah, it also. I mean, I was it. hoping you say yes, yeah. but I was honestly asking because I knew you all of a sudden had your son at yeah. home. Yeah. You had to do, you know, it was much more stressful and you were writing this book mm -hmm. and you said, well, it's about landscape. I said, you said something like, and working with your work doesn't take me away. It actually is, it's also about landscape, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. so I felt a little bit less guilty um, <laughs> about that. Well, I think that I think that like yours, it, it's also about um, you know reminding us about, about connection as well. Um, and I and I, it's interesting that what project during the pandemic that you took that you undertook was about connecting with people as well. Yeah, you were <laughs> mentioning the other day the, yeah. the, the project, uh, you have the book is also around the corner here on the bookshelf, the, um, Six Feet Apart in New York City. That was exactly while I was working on my book and yeah. you were working on your book yeah. and we couldn't, we, we had to connect but we had to 
be very sensitive about the quality of our connection to really be respectful of the other person's time and space. And um, yeah, you were saying something to me when we spoke about that. Um, mm -hmm. That I started this project by um, having friends come over and visit, and it wasn't meant to be a photo project or a book or a museum show, which has ended up being, it was literally just to meet up. And I remember where, when I grew up, people used to meet on the stoop, you know, on the, on the sidewalk. And so I said, well, why don't we just meet on the sidewalk uh, six feet apart, because yeah. that was safe. And, you know, we had by that time the masks already, which when we met, we didn't need wear masks, you yeah. know. And um, we, you know, I wouldn't touch, obviously, the chairs. <laughs> we made sure that um, I didn't touch somebody else's chair. I would do it maybe with a piece of paper or something about to move it. But it was really to connect. And because we were wearing masks, and we still are wearing masks, uh, a lot of us, um, I wear a mask a lot still, but I've had COVID a few weeks ago, so I feel kind of safe now for a bit and, and um, safe for you guys. But um, masks are still very important. But what you have to do with the mask is, which is a little bit like the way I guess I take pictures also, you have to distill what you say to somebody while you have the mask on, because we lip read a lot, even though we don't think we do, but we are. And if somebody talks in masks, it's like talking to somebody who's hard of hearing, or, because you have to be very clear, very short, very minimal, and you can't waste words. You have to be very, have to say what you mean, mm -hmm. and then wait for the person to say something back and listen. You don't have that exchange where both are talking. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's, it was an interesting experience how you fill the space. And it was again about space because the space in between us, which was sort of a building usually, became important again, the space between us, which is also the piece, space between the images. Or it's that empty space that actually creates the connection. Well, and see there, you're doing your translating again. You're, you're talking about your photography. It's really, it's really <laughs> nice to watch you like do it live. <laughs> it's like you didn't have access to your, and even in that project, it's like you didn't have access to the mountains and connection, and then you were, but then you're creating it in front of your house. So yeah, and, and then it just was... now you were like, I was like, which one are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> but maybe we should take some questions before. Um, yeah, I don't know uh, how long we've been yeah, talking. Yeah, we've been talking for a while, so oh, maybe, right. uh, maybe we should take a few questions from yeah. from anyone who's been listening along. So, shoot away, Mara. Well, I, I'd like to know. You sort of, I mean, there are other pictures on the other side, but you bracketed that wall with a very different space as this one is a very different space. You know, everything else is um, sort of a long line of notes, softer, you know, like staccato. And, and then you have these two vertical faces. Well, what actually happens is, I'll, I'll walk up to, so <laughs> the Torres del Paine are going up above the Alps to the top of the door the architecture, and then you, and then the Himalayas, it's going down again, and your eye rests on the cactus. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of, that's the link. So instead of having it sort of going here from the clouds to this, and over here going further there, and there this, I kind of went, up with the architecture and then down. And then I wanted your eyes to sort of rest at the cactus because there is another door again. Mm -hmm. And then you sort of turn and then you take in that wall, which we can't see now with this camera because we're in a different space. And uh, that, that kind of, I think, is the, the way I kind of 
worked with this space also, you know, the architecture of it, because we are in this space, so I didn't want to ignore that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? <laughs> Well, it does stop a bit with the characters, and that's also because you actually have to physically turn in order to see the next image because of the architecture, because there's two door there's the door, and you can't really go like this. You have to physically turn, and then you engage with the next thing um, because of the way this space is um, laid out. You know, I if I would take this to another museum. Um, I would probably hang it differently as I did also, you know, um, not intentionally, but the room would probably dictate that. Um, and so what, what I'm saying is also that you, that the viewer is actually performing as well because you are kind of Walking around. because there's these walls in the middle, it's not a gallery that where you could stand in the middle and experience everything around. You have to act actively move and decide where you stop. And then there's of course the rock as well. But a <laughs> there's a question in the back there. Yeah. Uh, I just had a quick question. Uh, thank you both for being here. It's such a lovely evening. Um, and really, it's a lovely way. Um, I love that you were talking about abstraction. Mm -hmm. uh, in your work, you find methods of abstraction. One thing um, that I noticed is just how expressive the line is. So, in, in so many of the works, um, and it's almost painterly, and you just were sort of talking about the connecting line as you're actually seeing the work. Can you uh, talk a little bit about how you find those lines and then say what the line means? Mm -hmm. Well, the, the painterly thing comes because I actually went to art school as a painter, and um, I um, I just sort of then started doing installations uh, with film and, and photographs. So I, I don't really see myself as a photographer. I'm just using that as a medium because, I mean, I guess I could paint this. I could be there. But that's not really, I think it's more immediate. And, um, but yeah, that was the reference paint. The thing with the light is that, um, um, I, I like the fact that you mentioned that actually because when we printed this, my printer, because I can't print this size, I can print 40 by 60 and I can print strips because my printer is the same quality as this one. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a professional printer, but it's, it's uh, 44 inches only. So I, you know, these are, um, um, what is it, uh, 89 by whatever, frame size is, 62 by 91, so they're yeah. bigger than what I can print. But I remember saying um, these, particularly this one, but it will be actually the law for most of them, that these, if you sort of squint your eyes and you look at the images, they all live by the highlights. Like the, the movement, and the shapes and the connections, so the highlights. So what I made sure was, and this happens to be the highlights, happens to be actually the sand that's blowing in the air, so, which is kind of magic anyway, which it shows again the trans, trans, transitionary, transitory, transitory, that's the word I meant, transitory uh, um, existence of these places. And so I made very sure that I enhanced and didn't lose the highlights because most photographic printers, my printer luckily is a painter, so she understands when I'm going gaga. She's not a photographer, which is a, my luck. Um, she understands that like this line there was very, very important for me. I think, I think at some point in the test, we lost, uh, we lost one of these lines. I think this one here. And I said, no, 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 we, I have to get that back. Um, because that's very important. So if you kind of look at things and you sort of squeeze your eyes, squint your eyes, you will see that, that um, my work 
that's maybe my trick or whatever. <laughs> my work lives off the highlights. And it's probably also makes it a bit more positive that way because we do react to light mm -hmm. in a very specific way. Mm -hmm. Darkness, um, you know, b before people were fascinated by mountains, uh, when was that like? Um, they were fascinated by darkness, the philosophers and the, you know, nobody was really interested in the light or, 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 or go up onto the peak of a mountain. That wasn't a thing at all. That's only developed uh, very quite recently, actually, mm -hmm. and um, so I think we are really looking, reacting to light and highlights. But it's at the same time because a lot of people here are probably printers or photographers. It's really difficult to print white. Mm -hmm. In the book, even more difficult. Mm -hmm. It usually goes kind of weird, not good. Um, like, have you ever tried to have a book with snowscapes, like Michael Kenner's books? Or They're very, very difficult to print. And so white is something that is very hard to bring out. But the pigment prints um, these days are of such great quality. And the papers that you can texture, create, yeah, like helps. that white there, took, it took me a long time to get, to get this white actually um, to that quality and not be murky, you know. Which is different disappear. from the white on the top of that mountain over there. That's really nice. Yeah. yeah. And, and then, then the, the same time different. it yeah. has like the clouds yep. and I had to be very careful to sort of in the book it's a little bit too sepia actually it's, mm -hmm. it's because I didn't get that right. Mm. It's difficult. But it obviously is very intentional and I probably um, like the glacier, you know, I'm attracted by the highlights because they, they really create that movement also, which is the movement that connects a lot of them. Maybe. I think there's another question on this side. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Uh, I, I'm curious about, you know, I mentioned we were talking about the printmaking process. And, and I had imagined these were in a book. I'm sorry we came in a little late. But let's say these were printed at 12 by 18, 18 by 27. They would all fit on that wall. Is, is the size of these prints, how important is that to the value of the exhibition or to the... Well, that's a very good question yeah. because I sometimes often feel that people make large prints to, for their ego, yeah, yeah, yeah. and what because I'm just because they can, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, so what? Yeah, but just because you can, you shouldn't always, right? <laughs> um, the reason why these are that size has is because if you have a smaller print in a, let's say, in a museum or in an exhibition, it's looked at as an artwork, a framed artwork, where else? These particular images, I don't print everything this size, but um, they look like picture windows. Mm -hmm. And you forget about the fact it's that, you, that it's art and you should be in awe of it. Because I want people to be, so it's the opposite of what it could be. Um, I want people to really feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. And um, so to me, they are the size of picture windows. Mm -hmm. It's a direct, um, kind of, you kind of can relate to it, you kind of feel, yeah. you're not looking at the documentation of, right. you think you are in, in yeah, in, you know. And so, they're not as big as they could be, I mean, you really, could, you know, you could go bigger if you wanted to, you know. So, I've, yeah. yeah, I mean, I, the, I have printed bigger because somebody needed that for, I mean, a client, you know, collector. But I think I totally but, see that, that they are in between this moment of, small and, and, and big enough so that they feel like they're in another, you're in another space. Yeah. Right. No, I mean, I, I think, yeah? I was going to say in the same line that standing in front of the work, you see the reflection of yourself in yeah. the space. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of also making that kind of connection. Right. Like you're part of the work or you're there on that level because it is so large. Right. And uh, another note, the whites, Amazing things out of just white, you yeah. know, like so that was, you know, the difference. And I love the white skies because it's not distracting. 
because of that? You know, it's like, how far away is that? Because you don't have the, um, the detail of the sky changing from like light blue mm -hmm. to dark blue and all that. Uh, blue skies are very, very distracting. If you look at, um, um, I always say Mark Klatch, remember he did the cactus, black and white, very powerful image. And I saw a few years later an image of his at my book publisher uh, with, a, with a bright blue sky behind, which there is usually, you know, where he takes them. And I only looked at the sky and I was like, yeah, if there's a... A blue sky, you usually the, it dominates, which is beautiful. We all want blue skies, but um, you know, I'm from a country where the sky isn't often blue, so I might be more comfortable anyway with this. But it actually does help to bring this out, yeah. And but the reflection is very important. important. Like somebody was saying, it's oh, what a shame that about the glass. I had a write up about that, and I'm like, no, it's actually, I, I mean. It's actually, yeah. I think part it's of it. part, part of, of it. Part of yeah, part of yeah. It. But it's also that the lack of the skies to me signals that you're doing something that goes back to your desire to make it art, to make mm -hmm. that, that the, the strangeness of the lack of the skies mm -hmm. is an indication that you're trying to create something, that these aren't just, you know, here's, you know, you know Peru or here's this place. Yeah. You're trying to create an experience here that is mm -hmm. somewhat artificial. Yeah. Right? Even though the sky often is, yes, it is. not in, in places, blue, yes. <laughs> and, and my husband knows, he waits for, for days sometimes to <laughs> wait um, with hot tea. He's very patient. I love him um, because I'm never alone. He's always with me. Um, so I, we both have a memory of all these places, uh, which is... Good. I think we should take one more, one more question. question. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's another question. And then I might suggest that we pause there and uh, anyone who wants to stay a little longer. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes. So the, the, the desert behind you, I, I can't take my eyes off of what looks like a little figure. And I'm curious about that decision on your part to include um, that because it's. Otherwise, you know, this expanse of desert. Well, you see, I took pictures of the white sands yeah. and the great sand dunes, which is this. Yeah. And um, the reason is because they are in a straight geographic line, and, and it used to be an old trade route with Santa Fe in the center. I, I usually have reasons, probably because I'm German. I, I need to have reasons. <laughs> like people would go, come and visit me in Dubai and take those. I'm like, no, no, no I they, need this, to have reasons. The, the, this is the reason why these two deserts are the only ones and there's only one ocean you ever see, which is the ocean that's the same ocean and same view. Um, that's so obsessive thing, but there's a reason. So now, we went various times to this location and we drove probably for about four hours from early in the morning and we arrived there and there's these people and I went, damn. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, was, I, was, I think I was swearing. I was like, yeah. why are they there? And they're not going to disappear so yeah, quickly. Yeah, not anytime soon. No, no, they are there. And um, so I took the picture anyway. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. what? And when I came home and I reevaluated my images, I thought, wow, this is actually a very important image because it, it shows you the scale because I have plenty of these, you can see them in the book, where there's no people. And these, you can see the scale. But there's other things that happen, which I only saw when I blew it up a bit bigger. You know, I didn't see that when I looked through. This child, there's no footprints. I didn't remove them, by the way. I don't digitally remove things and stuff like that. I'm not into that. Um, it's more like sort of equivalent of darkroom work that I'm doing in my images. But you sort of, normally we would should be worried about this child being so far away from its parents, I assume it must be the parents, but we're not worried about this child, perfectly happy for the child because obviously, and then I look at her and if you look closely, she's got 
this thing that you would have on a plane, I think, like a... A, a suitcase, like a, roll, a rolly bag. Yeah, I think yeah. so. Yeah. It looks like a... And so it's very weird, and I mean, I have a feeling they probably just go over that hill and then this dip. Maybe they were going to stay there and the child was going to go and slide down on well, one the, of those. The, the male person is carrying some sort of... Yes. Something that also looks very cumbersome for whatever... Oh, yeah. No, they would, they, they're staying the night. Um, so, indicate... And also, I, I was very annoyed by them. <laughs> and so I also thought, why does she have to wear a purple you know, it's shirt? My you know, everything it's just... <laughs> yes. But then I was actually... I got very, very fond of it. And it shows again that, um, it, you know, sometimes accidents or things you don't want kind of end up being a sort of guide towards something else or an, an important part of a project. So. Uh, I'd like to invite anyone who wants to stick around longer as long as you want to play, please do, and, and, and go take a look at those people. <laughs> Well, you can always email me. You can email me with more questions anytime, and I will answer. Thank you all.